Shabbat Shalom. Pray with me one more time, please. Father in heaven, as I stand by this communion table, this being a high Sabbath, I pray you will give me the words to speak so that all will know, know you better, Jesus, and want to come close to you. In your name I ask this. Amen. Jesus said, John 12, 32, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. The title of my sermon is The Center of Attraction. And the cross is the great center of attraction. Make no mistake about it. Everything you talk about when you talk your faith at all should be centered in the cross. This is just biblical. Ellen White said it this way, in the cross, all influence centers and from it, all influence goes forth. Have you ever heard the saying, someone's trying to be the center of attraction? Raise your hand if you've heard that. Maybe you've heard it with the word attention like the center of attention. You know, usually we think of little kids, oh, they're the center of attention or center of attraction. But when you think about it, that's our humanity. That's our life. There's always someone trying to be the center of attention or the center of attraction or something, something trying to be the center. And uh, I suppose like when we do church, the center of attraction is right here from the pulpit, whether we're singing or preaching or whatever we're doing, and people tend to pay attention. Similar to if you went to any other presentation where there's a, there's a stage, the speaker, isn't that true? When we go places like that, you go to a movie theater, the center of attention, the center of attraction is on screen, isn't it? Do you like interruptions to what you're trying to pay attention to? And that's what we always are fighting against, isn't it? Because there's always distractions from what should be the center of attraction. And that's including us when you're praying at home, when you're reading the Bible, when, or when maybe when you're trying to pray and your mind is being diverted to other things. Other things are distracting you from maybe your time with God. You know what I'm talking about? But the cross always centers us. Let's look at John's testimony from John chapter 1. And I'm going to look at John the Baptist. Now, sitting here with us today are, I'd say, about half the Hamby family. (laughs) Maybe more than half, because we go by height. The tallest one is here. I'm thinking Cindy and Eli being the shorter than Stephen, but Olivia and Micah being shorter than Eli. So we started a Bible study uh, last Friday, because Eli wants to be baptized. In fact, he's very urgent about it. You could tell the Holy Spirit was upon him. And so we're studying with the family, and we're going to study tonight at, at 6. And even Olivia has expressed an interest in baptism, too. And we're, we're exploring that. So, Because the center of their attention right now is getting baptized, following Jesus. And that relates to what we're doing today with communion. Everything centers in the cross. Why are we here? We're here because of the cross. Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Now, we did not do the foot washing because I asked you to do it at home simply because our building is still a little bit in disarray and we're getting things figured out. But last week at Thomaston, we had communion and I did foot washing with my brother Jeff. And so we, we experienced that. And you know, when you're washing one another's feet, for those of you who did it this week, I know Mort called me or texted me actually and said that they had a nice foot washing celebration at their home. It it draws you closer together. It draws you to one another because you're looking to Christ. When you kneel down before someone and wash their feet, you're serving them. But I know in the Adventist church, I mean, I didn't grow up in this church, but I learned quickly from others who did. They just got so used to communion and foot washing, it just became, okay, let's just go do it, get it done. And there's a purpose to foot washing. It's an ordinance of humility. Jesus said, Now that you see what I've done to you, you should do this to one another. 
There's a purpose to it. There's forgiveness. There's coming together. There's a unity. There's a bond that you cannot know unless you practice that ritual. And most Christian faiths don't practice this ritual. The Adventist church is one of the only ones that does because we see it's biblical. So we practice it. So I apologize for us not doing it here today. And if you didn't do it, maybe sometime this week with your significant other or someone, you can practice this ritual going to John chapter 13 and reading through that. You don't have to be around the pastor to do it. You know, and foot washing is like baptism. Let's kind of, it's been called a mini baptism. Because when we look here at, well, let's just, let me not get ahead of it. Let's look here and read from John chapter 1. And uh, I gave Eli a homework assignment before we studied. I wanted him to read about baptism. And so I wanted him to look at John the Baptist. And so these two passages we're going to look at today are two of the ones that we read in that family circle from John chapter 1 from Luke chapter 3. There were others, of course, but here we're going to learn something about baptism and repentance. And it has to do with the center of attraction. So verse 19, John the Apostle writes about John the Baptist, two different people, right? Now this is the testimony of John the Baptist, that is, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed, verse 20, and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Now, as we were reading this, and I had Eli read some of it, and I was asking him questions, he was kind of tripping over it a little bit. Now, he's 11 years old, but he's very mature in understanding and I said, sure, why are you tripping over that? He says, well, sometimes when I read the Bible, it's, it's a little bit hard for me. So I said, well, let's explore that. Why is that so? So if I ask you who you are, how are you going to answer? Eli said, I'm Eli. That makes sense to us, doesn't it? But the Bible doesn't speak like that, so it trips us up. Yes, even us adults. Because it's 2,000 years ago. It's a different culture, a different time. Notice the Baptist answer. It says, verse 20, he confessed and did not de deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Again, if someone asks you who you are, I just meant Sharice and Candace, and someone asks you, would you say, well, I'm not Candace? And Candace would say, well, I'm not Sharice. Picking on the visitors. You understand? Norm was, would you say, well, I'm not my wife, I'm not my daughter, I'm not the President of the United States? No, you wouldn't answer that way. We answer who we are. I'm Dean. So this confuses us. And we have to kind of go back to the culture to try to understand what he's saying. He says, I am not the Christ. Because John the Baptist knew something that we don't initially know, but we learn. And we get the idea when we go on. Verse 21. And they asked him, what then? They weren't confused by his answer, I'm telling you that. What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. See, they thought he was the Messiah or the Christ or claimed to be, and that's why they said, who are you? And verse 22, then they said to him, who are you, again, that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? Again, comes an answer that we don't expect in our time, in our culture. He's quoting from Isaiah the prophet. And he takes a verse from Isaiah the prophet and applies it to himself. And he says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. And I'm sure... That puzzled them. They understood him up to that point. Because now they have to go back and do a Bible study and check Isaiah chapter 40. If they remember, it's found in chapter 40. Of course, they didn't have chapters and verses like where they had to search the scroll. Verse 24. Now, those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize, seeing that you are 
not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet. Again comes a confusing answer. He's not telling him why he baptizes. At least it doesn't seem that way. He says, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. He's already here somewhere. I wonder if they're looking around. You do not know him. It is he who is coming after me, and he is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. Is John drawing attention to himself? No. But attention was drawn to John. They went out to John. Everyone was going to John to get baptized. Now, the Bible says John was preaching a baptism of repentance. We're going to find that in Luke just a minute, Luke chapter 3, among some other things. Because we're looking here today to see what is the great center. And what I want you to learn today, what the Bible wants us to learn, what the Lord wants us to learn, is how to talk to people. Not by saying who you're not. I mean, you don't have to be weird about it. But by learning how to draw people, not to you, but to Christ. Learning how to build bridges in your conversations. Perhaps you need this bridge today. Perhaps you need to be drawn to Christ today because you've been so distracted, usually by your own self. The Bible says in verse 28, These things were done in Bethabara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Now let's look over at Luke's testimony. Luke, who was a Gentile, a medical doctor, who wrote also the book of Acts. He knows a little bit about repentance. Actually, he knows a lot about it and a lot about Jesus. And we find some curious things here, starting in verse 1, Luke chapter 3. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, that's like a governor, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea, and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. By the way, if you want to know how to pronounce these words written in English that come from the Greek or Hebrew, just pronounce every single syllable and every single vowel, and you'll be 99% close almost every time. Don't worry about if A is long, A or short, A. Just pronounce it every single syllable and every single consonant, and you'll be good. So verse 2 says, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God, who did it come to? Who's it say? Is your Bible open? Came to John, and it calls him the son of Zacharias, and it came in the wilderness. And so that's John the Baptist. And verse 3, and he went into all the region around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Before I get to verse 4, we're going to just back up a little bit because I, I want to draw you to the center based on what we know today about time. Starting with the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Seventh-day Adventists are famous, at least in my mind they are, because that's what attracted me to this message when they showed me the proof that the Bible could be understood, that the prophecies were true. Daniel chapter 2, predicting 2,500 years of human history until the rock cut out without hands would come. The second coming of Jesus, which hasn't happened yet, is still in the future. Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8, predicting the rise and fall of kingdoms following in the path of following in the path of Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 9, predicting, predicting the exact time and the exact date. Yes, I'll even say the exact day. If you know your calendar, you can figure it out, in other words, of Jesus' crucifixion. Because we know he's crucified on the Passover. And we know he ministered three and a half years. And the Bible says here he started his ministry in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, a Roman emperor. And John the Baptist came six months before the Bible tells us and was preaching a baptism of repentance. And his purpose, the Bible says, was to prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight the way 
of the Lord. And Luke, in a moment, is going to tell us what repentance means right here. I'm sure Olivia remembers, maybe even Micah remembers a little bit, because we looked at what's the Bible teaching us. You know what repentance means, right? What's it mean? It means to turn, to turn around, face the other way. So in simple terms, for us who are coming to Christ, we've been selfish. Every human being, every one of you, myself included, has been, might still be, self-centered. You are the center of your own world. You are the center of your own attraction. How many times do you look in the mirror today and fix your face or your hair and have to go back again and look at it again because you just love yourself so much? Don't be shy about it. We know it's true. When I was younger, I used to think I was so pretty, like Muhammad Ali. And I got older, I started looking in the mirror like, man, I'm not so pretty. <laughs> I started realizing a lot of people a hundred times more attractive than me. It's like, wow. But when I was a boy, I thought I was so cute, you know. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that. Maybe your grandma tells you, oh, you're so handsome. You know, your mother and your father tell you things about yourself. And you start becoming self-centered real quick. Every single one of you has done this. Perhaps we still do. This is what we fight against. The Bible teaches us to die to self. Because we need to, as John later said, the Baptist, he must increase, but I must de decrease. And the Bible says there's never written a greater prophet. Jesus said, John the Baptist, there's not been a greater prophet than John. He's Elijah, if you'll believe it. There's a spiritual application to that. Jesus said a lot of things about John. What did you go out to see? What did you go into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? I tell you, John came to do God's will. And John did not grow up in the city, not even in the rural country city. He grew up in the wilderness. Read about his diet, his simple diet. Oh, how God must have trusted John. Because he's a human being. He can change his mind. Somehow, the way his parents, Elizabeth and Zechariah, raised him, he stayed with the Lord. He knew his duty. He did not shirk it. He was 100% more than anybody I read about in Scripture, maybe save Moses or people like that, 100% sold out to do the Lord's will. I want to be like that, don't you? It's hard for us because of all our distractions. But if we follow John's advice and follow the Bible's counsel, we can do it. In fact, we must do it. We must become like John the Baptist. We must point people to the Lord. This is what repentance means. Let's, let's see it here. Verse 4. Now, go back to verse 3. He went into all the region around the Jordan preaching what? What's your Bible say, verse 3? What was he preaching? A baptism of what? A baptism of repentance. Now watch the next verse. And he also says what baptism is for to begin with. He says it's for, what's it say it's for? The remission of sins. So the first thing we know is baptism of repentance. Repentance is for, and baptism is for forgiveness or the remission of sins. But there's more. Verse 4, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill brought low, the crooked places shall be made straight, the rough way smooth, and all flesh, how much? Everyone shall see the salvation of of God. Jesus said, if I'm lifted up, I'll draw all people to myself. This is, comes before Jesus said that. This is hinting strongly at that. The cross is the great center. Christ lifted up, dying for our sins. Yes, and rising again, and ascending to heaven, and the hope of his soon return, that is the center, but it all revolves around the cross, because he's not coming again without the cross. He's not ascending to heaven without the cross. He's not being resurrected without the cross. There's the cross. And there's a cross for you too. And if you're avoiding that cross, well, then you don't have Christ. This is why we come to communion, to remember these things. Verse 4, it says, as it is written. 
And then he says, crying in the wilderness, making straight the way of the Lord. What was John's role? To prepare the way for Jesus. He came six months before Jesus. Every mountain is laid low. Every valley is brought up. We talked about this last Friday night. In fact, Stephen brought it up. You know, the, the, these Roman rulers, they would travel the easy way. They had all kinds of slaves and soldiers to make their path smooth. And so if they're going in a chariot and the road's bumpy, mile ahead or however much ahead, they're filling in the divots. They're taking out the bumps. They're making that road so comfortable for that Roman ruler to come through. Or it could be their head. And in a similar way, the Bible is telling us that's John's role. And you need to believe the truth of the matter. Because the Baptist is, the Elijah message is supposed to come again. It's already supposed to be here. We are supposed to be preaching the Elijah message. We are, you and I together, are to make straight the way of the Lord. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make it easier for people to come to Christ. Take the bumps away. Take the hurdles away. Fill in the gaps. You know truth. You know your testimony. What can you share with others that will help them along the way to know Christ better? I don't think there's anybody on the face of the earth that knows it better than Seventh-day Adventists should know. I'm not saying they do know that we do know, but should know because we have everything in place to know the truth and to be made free. The only thing that keeps any of us from being totally free is our own getting off the center of the cross and looking at the center of self, even if it's, whoa, I can't do this, I can't do that. Who are you looking to if you can't do something? You're not looking to Jesus because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But without me, Jesus said, you can do how much? Nothing. Our own problem most of the time is ourself. Other people too, but it ultimately comes down to ourself. So repentance to turn to the Lord, turn away from self. When you help turn another person to the truth, you're helping to give them repentance. The Bible says in Acts chapter 5 that Jesus gives repentance to Israel, but he does it through us, through you. If you'll accept the assignment, if you'll walk with him so you can do it, Jesus gives repentance to Israel. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now, what has the world done to get us off the true center of attraction? Oh, my. Let's just talk about our year. Today is August 12th. Besides anniversaries we talked about, Lula and Riley, and, and, and happy anniversary, by the way. And, uh, well, that's what you said, right? You're looking like it's not. Is today not your anniversary? Yes? Yeah? Your name Lula. The only Lula I know. Is today your anniversary? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Well, happy anniversary anyway. And, then, and birthdays. Today's my sister's birthday. She's four years older than me, so she's 70 now. Wow. 2023. You know, the proper way of saying it is AD 2023. What does AD mean? Do you know? Oh, you thought it means after death. That's what my daddy told me when I was young, too. No, it doesn't mean after death. Because did the year start after the death of Christ? No, it actually is supposed to mean after the birth of Christ. And that's why Cindy, Steve's wife, nailed it, Olivia's mother. She knew it was Anno Domini. Anno, the year of, Domini, our Lord. Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. The proper way of saying A.D. 2023 is in the year of our Lord, 2023. Supposedly meaning 2,023 years after Christ appeared on earth, after his birth, after what we would call Christmas. But you know, they got it wrong. Now, it was in around 525, A.D. 20, 20, there was a, a wicked Roman ruler by the name of Diocletian back around the 3rd century, just before, he's the one that comes just before Constantine, 3rd to 4th century. And they made years in the year of Diocletian, Roman years. And in 325, 325, that's over 1,700 years ago, or close to it, 
the Council of Nicaea, the first Council of Nicaea, they got together, they wanted to learn what's the correct date of Easter. Of what? Easter. In fact, one website I read called Science Live said that in Europe, the main reason for doing math, one of the main reasons, not the only one, for doing mathematics was to determine the correct date for Easter because they did not know. That council determined that Easter would finally be celebrated on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. That's why it changes every year, because you have to wait for the full moon after the spring equinox. Spring equinox happens around March 20, 21. First full moon can range anywhere in a three to four week period after that. Then you've got to wait for the next Sunday. That's why sometimes Easter is in March and sometimes it's in April, and it varies. What they did not seem to realize or know, or maybe they did, is they mix things up. They're trying to attract people. It was called the year of our Lord. B.C. did not exist yet. That came a couple hundred years later. And, and, and a certain priest by the name of Dionysius, good Greek name, 525, 80, 525, just figured out what the year one the year of our Lord 1 should be. In other words, he figured out what he thought was the birth of Christ. 1 AD 1. And the whole purpose, again, because the church is in Europe, it's the world, and they're trying to draw people to Christ. At least that, maybe to the church. And did it work? Certainly it worked. Did it work the right way? We'll talk about that a little bit. So he fixes the date 1 A.D., thinking that's the birth. Now we know today they were about four years off because it looks, scholars look like Jesus was born around 4 B.C. And B.C. does, in fact, mean before Christ, before the birth of Christ. So they looked at some information to figure it out, and, and, and they got it wrong. Where's God's hand in that? Did God tell us the day of Jesus' birth? Did God tell us to worship on the day of Jesus' birth? Did God invent Christmas? And the answer is no. And for that matter, not even Easter. We remember the Lord's death till he come. Yeah, Easter's a good time to do it. But we remember it when we do communion. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So communion is really what Easter is supposed to be about as often as you do it, more than once a year. So the center of attraction for years, even in Europe, was Christ, the cross, the church, but there was a lot of miscommunication, a lot of false doctrine. So was it really there? And we could ask the question, you know what happened lately? It started in the 18th century. And it wasn't until the, eight, the 1980s that... A.D. and B.C. became official international standard. There's many different ways to measure years. And it wasn't until just about 40 years ago that A.D. and B.C. became official international standard. And that's modern times. Christianity's on the move. You know, they're trying to trump everything else. And people got offended by that, unbelievers. And so they came up with something called B.C.E. and C.E. B.C.E., before the Common Era. A.C., well, C.E., excuse me, C.E., Common Era. Meaning virtually the same thing, except it takes Christ's name out of it. It's not, they don't claim to be stamping out Christ. They say, we're, we're trying to help people accept and adopt the common year without being offended, people who aren't Christians. Now, at first glance, you and I, and fundamentalist Christians especially, could say, oh, I'm offended by that. They're trying to erase Christ. Well, let's just stop and think about that a moment. Doesn't it make and create an opportunity for you and I to share the truth as we know it as Seventh-day Adventists of when Jesus was really crucified and perhaps when he was born too, and to point to what the Bible says is important, what the true center of attraction is, not the birth of Christ, per se. Not a day called Christmas. The birth of Christ is important. Don't get me wrong. But not the exact day, because God never told us the day. 
Go ahead and celebrate his birth. But don't get affixed to it. You know, by doing Easter and Christmas, they, they attach those to pagan holidays. And that was to try to bring the sin of attraction the pagans had when they worshiped the sun, the shortest day of the year at Christmas, the, the changing of day, equal day, equal night, at the equinox. And the longest day, of course, is the first day of summer. They were worshiping the pattern of the sun, and they were trying to attract those pagans to Christianity. So they morphed the beliefs of the Bible and mixed them with pagan beliefs. And that's what we've known for the last 2,000 years now. But I see a conversation brewing where I can build a bridge with someone to show them, well, I'm not offended by CE and BCE, common era and before the common era, because I can tell them Christ wasn't born in 180 anyway. And you know, there was no year zero. Do you know why there was no year zero? Because zero didn't exist when they invented the era. Europe didn't know anything about zero for hundreds of years until after AD and BC were invented. And BC didn't come in until 200 years later, and that was because, well, how can we mark backwards? Let's go backwards, like 1 BC, 2 BC, 3 BC. Let's look like negative numbers, counting backwards. First time it ever happened. Because the world had different ways of recording time, recording years. AD and BC attracts people to Christ by name. But now, with your witness, so should B, C, E, and C. Should it not? Should you not be able to have a conversation with people to attract them back to Christ? What's the center of your life? Is the center of your life objecting to everything that goes on in the world whenever they do this or they do that to, to, to compromise my faith? They pass this law. And they, is that the center of your life? You might be able to talk about it. No, the center of your life should be Christ and him lifted up. I, if I am lifted up, will draw all people to myself. Christ and his cross, that's the great center, and that should be your center. And if you get this right, if we get this right, we will draw people to the true Christ, and we will draw people to our faith. I mean, has the conspiracy theory model been working for y'all? It's been on for over 100 years, and even before that time. It doesn't seem to be growing our church much, does it? Why? Because when you talk conspiracy theories, you're not centering it in the cross. You're centering in your ideas and someone else's philosophy, and, and you could be wrong or they could be wrong, but Christ is never wrong. The cross is never wrong. Center all you talk about in Christ. And let's start drawing people to the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. Lift up Christ as much as you can, without offending people, of course. Truth does matter. So if you want to understand Jesus and his cross better, look to the truth. Share what the Bible says. Point to Christ. You know, um, Joey Livingston, I think I told you about him last week. Well, at least by email I did because I wasn't here last week. He was in a traumatic automobile accident a little over a week ago, went off an overpass in Texas, broke his back in several places, many broken ribs, lacerated face. He cannot walk. The first several days, he did not know who he was or where he was. He's a member at Thomaston. He called me this morning, one of the reasons I was late to church, or actually late to Sabbath school. Good thing I had you teaching for me. I thought it was for other reasons, but yeah, that one too. Because they're sending him home today on about a 20-hour ambulance ride from Midland, Texas to Thomaston, Georgia with three drivers. It's a nonstop trip. Man can't walk. He has a great testimony how wonderful the nurses were and the doctor was, but the hospital administration wants to send him home because, you know, there's lack of insurance, lack of this, lack of that. Man can't walk. Where's his treatment going to come from? But he was turning to the Lord. He told me, he says, wow, the Lord really sat me down and, and gave me something to think about. He had to be cut out of the van. It fell so many feet down between two bridges. I mean, it's amazing he's still alive. Now, I know because I talked to him several months ago, and I saw Joey is coming back to Christ. He was repenting. He was, turning, he was turning back from himself being the center 
uh, my job, my worries, this, to Christ being the center, because he had a wonderful testimony. And then this happened, and I talked to him last week, and again this morning, and he has an even more solid testimony about turning back to Christ. More, he wants to give testimony. He wants to share the word down there with the people, what God has done for him, and, and he's seeing the Lord in these nurses and doctors who didn't even know him before in the hospitals down there in Texas. You see, you have a story to tell. Repentance turns you to the Savior, to the cross. Those who repent become fellow workers in the spirit of John the Baptist. What are they to do? What are you to do to prepare the way for the Lord for others, to make straight the way of the Lord? to prepare the way of the Lord before your fellow human beings. The cross is the center. All influence centers from it, and all influence goes forth from it. Before I close, I want to read this passage from Ellen White. You can find this in the devotional book, Lift Him Up. The cross is the center is what it's called. And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. Listen to these words. The cross of Calvary challenges and finally will finally vanquish every earthly and hellish power. In the cross, all influence centers, and from it, all influence goes forth. It is the great center of attraction, for on it, Christ gave up his life for the human race. This sacrifice was offered for the purpose, do you know the purpose? For the purpose of restoring man to his original perfection. Back to the image of God. This, yea, more, it was offered to give him an entire transformation of character, making him more than a conqueror. Are you looking for a transformation of character? Those who in the strength of Christ overcome the great enemy of God and man will listen to this, occupy a position in the heavenly courts above angels who have never sinned. If you can believe that, we will be above angels. I, Christ declares, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. If the cross does not find an influence in its favor, it creates an influence. Isn't that powerful? I underlined that. Let me read it again. If the cross does not find an influence in its favor, it creates an influence. Mm. Through generation succeeding generation, the truth for this time is revealed as present truth. Christ on the cross was the medium whereby mercy and truth met together and righteousness and peace kissed each other. This is the means to move the world. Let me ask you before I go on. What is the means to move the world? Jesus. It's Jesus, right. The cross of Jesus. His death, what he did for us. It's the means to, it'll break hearts. You can't stand before the cross and contemplate the cross without having your heart broken and feel so low and bad about what you've done to God. Give someone a view of that and they will come to Jesus. In the plan of God, all the riches of heaven are to be drawn upon by men. All. Nothing in the treasury of divine resources is deemed too costly to accompany the great gift of the only begotten Son of God. Christ was empowered to breathe into fallen humanity the breath of life. Those who receive him will never hunger, never thirst. For greater joy than found in Christ there cannot be. Study the words spoken by the Savior from the Mount of Blessing, how the divine nature shone through his humanity as his lips uttered the benedictions upon those who were the objects of his mercy and love. And when you read Matthew chapter 5 and 6 and 7, put yourself in the position as one of his listeners, as if you were there. So the benediction's on you, I might add. 
He blessed them with a fullness that showed that he was drawing from the inexhaustible store of the richest treasures. The treasures of eternity were at his command. The Father committed the riches of heaven to him. And in the disposal of them, meaning the giving out of the gifts, he knew no bound. Those who accept him as their Savior, their Redeemer, the Prince of Life, he acknowledges before the heavenly host, before the world's unfallen, and before the fallen world, how does he acknowledge them, it says here, as his peculiar treasure. So what is Christianity? Christianity is God's instrumentality for the conversion of the sinner. Jesus will call to account everyone who is not brought under his control. Everyone who does not demonstrate in his life the influence of the cross of Calvary. Christ should be uplifted by those whom he has redeemed by dying on the cross at death of shame. He who has felt the power of the grace of Christ has a story to tell. You have a story to tell. He seeks to put in operation methods of work which will diffuse the gospel of Christ, meaning you. Humanity, drawing its efficiency from the great source of wisdom, is made the instrumentality, the working agency, through which the gospel exercises its transforming power on heart and mind. That means you again. We are the instruments. We are the instrumentality through which the gospel works. I will close with this scripture from 2 Corinthians 5.20, I believe, or 21. All the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God. Do you know the last two words? How many times have I asked this question? You should know by now. Do you know the last two words? All the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God. Last two words, through us, amen.